Hello, my brothers, and thank you for allowing me to be a part of this special event today, the Northern British Columbia Masonic Day. I want to, first of all, thank the Central Interior Pass Masters Club for putting all this together, and Brother Bob Lees for extending the invitation to me to participate. Also, a special thanks is in order to the brothers of Quainel Lodge for taking the time to come to British Columbia and participating in this event. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Juan Sepulveda. I am a member of Eola Lodge number 207, free and exit to Masons in the state of Florida. And I am the host of a Masonic podcast and blog called The Winding Stairs. I'm also part of a another podcast called The Masonic Roundtable. And the reason uh, Brother Bob got in touch with me and invited me to participate is because Masonic education is something that is very important to me and is something that I've I dedicate a lot of time and effort into fostering within my lodge, within my district, and thanks to the, the privilege of us having technological advances, I can, I can reach brothers as far as where you are. So even virtually, I'm able to participate and be a part of your event. And I hope that what I have prepared for you today has a, at least a little bit of, a, of an influence in, in the way that you move forward. I also would love to hear from you later on, on your thoughts about my presentation and how I can also help other brothers that I reach to with regards to Masonic education. I want to talk about bridging the gap. And what we're doing right here is bridging the distance gap and providing Masonic education or inspiration or having a conversation at least virtually. I feel very fortunate that we're able to do this. But where does that come from? Where does that desire to bridge the gap comes from? I think this is something that is part of humanity from time immemorial. For as far back as we can imagine, men have found that desire. They've had this necessity to move from where they are to where they want to be. It forces them to make decisions, hard ones at times, to move from who they are and become who they want to become. If it wasn't for that spirit of, uh, of innovation and that motivation to bridge the gap, we wouldn't have men like George Washington who was able to create a bridge over the chasm of tyranny in the United States. Or we wouldn't have men like Charles Lindbergh who was able to shorten the distance between New York and Paris. Or we wouldn't have men like Buzz Aldrin who went as far as to bridge the gap between the sole of his feet and the surface of the moon. Now, what is bridging the gap in relation to Freemasonry? I have three specific things I want to talk to you about regarding bridging the gap within Freemasonry. And the first one is bridging the gap of expectation. And I'll start by telling you uh, a funny story that happened to me when I became interested in Freemasonry, allow me to start with a funny story that happened to me. When I became interested in Freemasonry, um, many years went by and I did some research, some over the surface research because I didn't want to spoil the experience if given the opportunity to join. But I found out things that made me very curious and things that I really hoped became part of my initiation experience and my, my progress through joining Freemasonry. So I went online because I'm very technologically inclined. I try to stay in touch with the latest trends and, and try to use these tools to further my, my efforts to become a better man uh, in life. So I, I looked in my community, try to find where's the nearest lodge. Fortunately, several of the lodges nearby had a website that was updated, that was functional, that showed a glimpse into what I could expect from, from visiting. So I reached the one that I believed was the, the most convenient for me to, 
to join and I submitted my petition. Unfortunately, I submitted my petition near the end of the year where uh, our elections in, in the state of Florida happened um, in, uh, towards the tail end of the year. So by December the 28th, the, the transition uh, from, from the past masters to the new ones is, is starting to happen. Well, I submitted then, but I had no idea what to expect. So I wasn't, nobody explained to me that there's a lot of events happening towards the end of the year related to the Masonic community. Nobody told me that election was happening and that it was a very hectic time for me to, to seek admission. Therefore, any response from the, the petitions committee, it was significantly delayed. Uh, I started be, to become impatient. I started to think, I wonder if they've accepted me or not. Uh, have they found me worthy <laughs> to be part of this organization or not? Which, it was just uh, senseless paranoia. But I did actually reach out to the secretary of the lodge. And I happened to be in touch with him through another of these technology tools. And you've probably heard of Twitter, right? For those of you who, don't, who might not know, Twitter is just an application for communication in which you express yourself by little sentences, 140 letters or 140 characters or so. It's a very informal way of communicating. And if you think of email, some people consider it to be a little bit of in, informal when it comes to business or lodge communications. Well, Twitter is even less formal. Now, my expectation of a response, I expected someone to, uh, you know, this is how I envisioned it. I envisioned that perhaps I would be walking on the mall, minding my own business, and out of the corner of my eye, I would see a man dressed in a dark suit with sunglasses, looking very dapper, very suspicious, and that he would approach me shake my hand and hand me a parchment envelope sealed with a Masonic seal, uh, symbol on a wax seal and he was going to disappear out into, into nothing. And when I opened it up, there would be a letter saying, congratulations, you have been accepted into the prestigious order of the Freemasons. Well, my expectations were not met. I found out of my admittance through a tweet. The gentleman who I communicated with, he just made a public announcement through Twitter saying, oh, yep, you're in. Very informal, completely opposite to what I expected. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I feel privileged that I was given admittance and that I was found worthy and well qualified because I have now, you know, grow uh, significantly as a man, uh, as a you know, community, uh, as a person in my community. But I wish, I wish that that moment was a little bit different because it happens only once and it's never going to happen again. There was one chance of that man to make an impression on me. So I encourage you to think about this, uh, this story, when it, it is in your hands to give a response to a petitioner. And one of the things that I've, that I've said before, that it might be a good idea to have a very nicely done letterhead. And you might be surprised, not all lodges seem to have this process down pat. This is the very first experience that a, a member of the community has with Freemasonry. So we want to give that uh, first impression, we want it for it to be a very, very good one, a memorable one. Now, I'm not, I'm not advocating for us to um, have a, two knights on a horse handing a man a, a parchment envelope, but a tweet is something that we should really uh, consider as an option to, to communicate to someone who is seeking admission into our fraternity. So there's that gap of expectations. And I would be foolish to come to you and just say, this is not, we shouldn't do this. I like when people bring concerns to the table. I like for them to also have 
at least one solution. And like I say, I like, I like it even better when people come with a solution and also a commitment to help in that. And perhaps this secretary that tweeted to me about the, my acceptance into the fraternity, perhaps he had a lot going on. I really can't judge why he chose to send me a tweet as opposed to taking the time and you know putting together a really nice letter. Uh, so I really don't want to ju jump into conclusions. And I, I love my lodge dearly, but they know that I use this story as an example of how we need to strive for excellence in even the most minuscule moments uh, in which we interact with the public because it actually helps in bridging that gap of expectations. We perhaps uh, make their expectations a little bit more realistic. If someone had told me that a man in a suit wasn't going to stop me in public, uh, perhaps I would have, uh, the shock wouldn't be as, as, as great whenever I received that tweet. So one of the solutions that, that I have is for everybody to communicate what was their expectation before petitioning for uh, the degrees in Freemasonry? Sometimes in, this happens in business uh, quite a lot that whomever is the leader of the business makes a decision that feels good or they think, well, this would be good. But oftentimes they miss opportunities because they don't actually tap into the sources that they have access to. There might be people out there that have different expectations about their business, about what direction their product line is going to move into. And if that business owner only took the time to actually listen and inquire as to what the expectations outside were, the results that he would have in his business, his or her business, would be even greater. So we can do that. As leaders in, in masonry, one thing that we should not shy away from is to actually ask, how do you envision this process happening? What do you think about this? And by having that little bit of insight into the mind of the petitioner, we might be able to, without, to, you know, without a great cost, meet their expectations or even exceed it. But if we're just blindly going around and, and, and doing things, it might, you know, we might not meet or exceed their expectations. Uh, oftentimes, what end up, ends up happening in different Masonic jurisdictions is that there is a standard. There is something that should be followed. There is a procedure that is considered by the respective Grand Lodges as the appropriate, uh, appropriate way of handling the situation. But unless we are all really in touch with that, that process and continue to increase our knowledge regarding it, we might do something a little bit different just because we think it's a good idea. But sometimes it is... Um, it is evident that the reason why these standards are in place is because people have tried and tried again and polished that, um, that process a little bit better. The second thing I wanted to mention regarding bridging the gap is bridging the generational gap. And although every lodge has a great variety of ages, there are some young men who join the fraternity who still have a lot to develop in their own personal life. Many of them are not yet married. They, have, they don't have children, or perhaps their career is still uh, progressing. They still haven't reached a pinnacle within their industry or their, or their career. Meanwhile, there's many other brothers who have incredible experience, who have had season after season of life lessons that they could share with these younger men. I have heard stories from uh, very close friends of mine who happen to be Masons that the reason that they joined Masonry was because in their personal lives they were they were missing, uh, um, you know, a like a father figure. Some of them had fathers, but they perhaps were missing that leadership and that advice, that mentorship that can come with experience. So. The generational gap that exists within the lodge, and perhaps you might have noticed that when there is a there's a dining uh, there's a moment with before the lodge where everybody sits to to dine in the festive board. There you might see different groups forming. You have a table that has only the past masters, and there's another table that has 
the youngest entered apprentices. And there's another table that has, you know, the members of this committee and the members of the other group. And it seems to all be separate. I am an advocate for, you know, going from table to table, talking to different people, not, not fearing interacting with the past masters. And, and I'll, I'll direct this, this particular comment directly to the, the past masters of the lodge. As young apprentices, or at least I'll give you my example, initially I was intimidated. I was intimidated to approach a master, a past master, with a question. Um, it, it, it's almost natural for us to, to think that uh, there is a, a progression through which you should direct your question. So just like in a, in a military setting, you, you go to your superior to bring a concern and not go directly to the general when you happen to walk by him. But it is different in, in masonry. And it took me a while to really understand this, that we meet on the level. We are brothers from that moment when we take our obligation. We are on the level. And yes, there is a great discrepancy or there's a, a great gap of information from one generation to the other. But herein lies our job to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. Also, uh, some, of the younger, uh, some of the younger members of the fraternity shouldn't be concerned. Just like I mentioned, we all meet in the level. We meet on the level and we should be able to freely speak with one another and try to explore as much as possible um, the, the lessons of Freemasonry and the lessons that come, that come with age. Now, going back to the way that I found out I was accepted into the fraternity, the gentleman who, who was the secretary at the time was relatively young. And if he had a better contact with a, a more seasoned brother, perhaps they would have been able to counsel him in the right direction so that the, the quality of his communication was up to par with the expectations of someone from, from the outside. The other benefit of bridging this generational gap is, an example, is what's happening right now. I am able to be in the hot, Florida weather right now and I am recording a video that's going to travel thousands of miles and be presented to you during your event. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have the opportunity to be with you in person and I do look forward to one day actually sitting in lodge with all of you. Uh, but right now, that's an, it's not an obstacle because I, uh, Brother, Bo uh, Brother Bob had the, the, the insight that perhaps we can do this remotely. And I'm glad that we thought about it because I'm still able to participate and technically sit here with you and, and discuss some, some lessons that, that I have learned. So what the young, uh, the young members of the fraternity have to offer in, in a way is that, that openness to technology and that familiarity with the latest and greatest in applications and social media because that's one of the things that is helping in, at least in my district and the, the brothers that I have access to, that access to technology is helping the fraternity in significant ways. Uh, one of the ways is that uh, open communications can be, can be done in this way, through video, through podcast, through blogs, social media. Uh, today, it, it's, it's almost rare for a lodge not to have a Facebook page. And that's another topic that, uh, that we can discuss later on. You'll hear me talk about that in my podcast, The Winding Stairs. Because there's a lot of little things that come into play when it comes to actually opening the doors of your lodge to technology, uh, more, more especially when it comes to social media. But at least it's, it's a way in which people are finding lodges. Brothers... Uh, that are active in the social media networks, which happen to be usually some of the younger uh, brothers of the lodge, they are the ones, they are the face of your lodge because they are the ones who are present on, online. So whenever someone from the outside is trying to reach your lodge, they're actually reaching some of your younger members of the, of the fraternity. So bridging that informational gap and having some of the more seasoned brothers 
meet with the younger ones that have a presence on social network can guide them into actually giving the best first impression of your lodge to a candidate from the outside. Also, it's a very, uh, a very effective tool for communicating events, communicating um, things that happen in the community, being more present to the community, which also helps in increasing membership. Now, the third and final aspect of bridging the gap that I want to talk to you about is bridging the personal gap. When I joined Masonry, it was for one reason. I had read that it made good men better. I had seen the example in, in relatives of mine who were members of the fraternity, and I could admire how great men they had become after joining the fraternity. And that is one of the things that I was seeking. I wanted to give my wife and my kids the best opportunity of enjoying the best version of me possible. And there's one way to do it, is to actually, once you are a part of the Masonic fraternity, to pay attention to these lessons and not just learn them, but also see how they can apply to your life. See how they can make you a better man and mason. We never reach perfection, which is the reason why our labors never cease. We continue to continuously progressing into becoming better men, better masons, better leaders in the community. So paying attention to that gap that might exist between who we are today and who we want to become, that is one of the greatest gifts that we give ourselves and we give the people that surround us because we might have some, some wants in our life. We might have some deficiencies or some superfluities that when we pay attention to the lessons that are within our, our gentle craft, then we're able to really pay attention and, and take the necessary steps to become the ultimate version of ourselves. And this happens when we are in tune with one another. I love that we're able to join together here through this uh, virtual conversation because it helps, uh, it helps me also reflect on the things that I have been learning. Once I stop, uh, stop communicating with you, I'll go back and I'll review the things that I said. And if, is there a way in which I could become better at those? Is there a way in which I could better apply some of the lessons that I'm sharing with you today? I'm not perfect, and I don't think that I will ever be perfect, but it's that progression that I continue, and that you brothers continue. That's what sets you apart in your community. That's what sets you apart in the lodge, who best can work. So I leave you with this. I leave you with this thought. I'm not saying that you have to be a military general like George Washington. And I'm not saying that you have to become an explorer and risk your life and try to be an aviator like Charles Lindbergh, or that you have to become an astronaut like uh, Brother Buzz Aldrin. But what I'm saying is this, that there are gaps that we recognize in our life. There are things that we know could be better, whether it is how we treat ourselves, how we treat each other, the way in which we practice the lessons of our craft, there are something, sometimes gaps that need to be addressed. Now I encourage you to consider, once you recognize these gaps, think, what's your role within it? What is it that you can do? Or what is it that you can inspire others to do in order to bridge those gaps? and help continue to polish that stone, help continue breaking the superfluities of that rough stone, thereby making it a better fit for the builder's use. Thank you again for the opportunity to join you today and may your travels be safe and I hope that I continue traveling with you up the winding stairs. <laughs>